Hey, Justin here with Stay at Home Dads Podcast. Once again, welcome to the place I talk about a lot of different things that go on in my dad life. My stay at home perspective on being a dad with my kids, my family, men's mental and physical wellness, parenting struggles and tips that I come across, as well as a few other interesting topics kind of sprinkled in there. So I hope you enjoy some of that and thank you for being here today thank you for tuning in all right so i hope i didn't bother anyone by talking a bit of politics last week but it's such a mainstay in our lives it's like how can this not be talked about sometimes right there always seems to be some dumb bullshit going on within politics and it seems like the older i get the more that those little things seem to annoy me well they're not really little things they're big things So should I add more political topics here and there? Should I talk a little more what's going on in that realm? Uh, You know, I, I don't think I can do that. This is a show about kids, not clowns, right? So, I mean, clowns are fun. Clowns are funny. Clowns are also scary. So it's either one of those, you know, funny or scary. So... I don't know. It may come up now and then. I'm not going to make it like a big deal and do it all the time. That's not really my realm of what I want to talk about. One thing I will say, though, is why are they so old? Why is everybody in politics and Congress and Senate so old? It's like they should be checking themselves into a Shady Acres instead of making policies. But anyways, that's for another time. That's for another discussion. So what I want to do today is continue where I left off about talking about parenting styles and types. Last week I talked about the extra hands-on parent, that helicopter variety, right? Those parents who over-parent, which, yes, that's something I do on occasion. Remember, they, they help too much, they solve too quickly, solve problems too quickly, they don't give enough autonomy, maybe... They don't trust, maybe I don't trust my kids to do the right things or make the right decisions sometimes. You know, things in the name of safety. Well, today I want to talk about the polar opposite of the overparent, and that would be the free-range parent. Not free-range chicken, but the free-range parent, the hands-off parent. And also, I might mention a few others that I kind of came across over the weekend when I was thinking about this and reading some other articles. And actually, wow, now that I just said chicken, it's totally just dawned on me the whole free range thing. Free range, no cage, right? Free range kid, no containment. Boom. Like, I don't know, it just dawned on me. Crazy. So anyways, the first thing, it may sound kind of redundant, but what is that free range parent? I hope anyone that's in the parenting kind of space has heard of that term before. Aside from my little chicken reference that I just made, it's not about being a neglectful parent. It's not about even allowing kids just to make all the decisions for themselves or make really stupid decisions for themselves. It's a lot deeper than that. It goes into a lot more things. Now that I've been reading on it, that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind. Is it just this hands-off parent that doesn't give a shit? But it's not that. It's a lot deeper. And this article that I had found, this lovely little article on familyeducation.com that I'm referencing today. I'll link it in the description, of course. But in there, they see the idea of free-range parenting actually came about around 2008 when this writer named Lenore Skenazy, talked about letting her nine-year-old son take the New York City subway home by himself. The media got it, the public got it, they went totally nuts, they blew it up, and that's kind of what brought the whole free-range parent kind of slogan to the forefront of people's minds, for good and for bad reasons, right? They say free-range parenting generally focuses on allowing children time for plenty of unstructured play, encouraging them to explore and see things and go to places without direct parental supervision. Less frequent use of technology as well, and many more opportunities to spend time outdoors, spend time in nature, which, okay, that sounds kind of cool, right? They also say this article, the one that wrote it is a Dr. Amy Webb. She says that free rangers base their decisions less on fear of kids being harmed or injured, but rather on 
is the child responsible and ready to take on the added responsibility of the independence? Now, okay, they say this came to prominence in 2008, but kind of, come on, really? Why was this so shocking back in 2008? Isn't this how pretty much all of us 30 and 40 year olds and beyond were raised? I mean, riding the subway by yourself at 9 or 10 years old, yes, that's alarming. That's shocking, right? I don't think I would do that to my kids, that's for sure. But aside from that, or aside from things like that, at least in my memory, I don't really see a problem letting kids go play and ride their bikes outside. I remember doing that, riding bikes to the park, playing outside at parks by yourself, playing outside until it got dark and then you went home or got dusky out, right? I remember my parents didn't want me just sitting around in the house. They wanted me, they encouraged me to go out and entertain myself with my siblings, finding things to do, climbing trees, uh, you know, building forts and all that stuff. I actually remember climbing a tree once that was higher than the two-story house we lived in. And I feel like I was above the roof line. So, risky? Yes. Fun? Hell yes, that was awesome. I, I, I remember that day now, and that was over 30 years ago. So, anyways, Amy goes on and says that there is this notion that people think kids were actually safer back in the day, back in the 80s and the 90s. And the media today does a lot of fear-mongering to lead us to believe that our kids aren't safe today. But statistics show violence against children and abductions are actually quite rare, even less today than they were back then. So that's kind of an interesting fact there. And they actually have some studies linked in this article. So if you click on the article and then go through there, you'll see some studies that you can kind of check out and poke around and look at if you want to. And actually the first case that really pops into my head about abductions and stuff, I mean, I grew up in Minnesota. We had this kid named Jacob Wetterling. He was also from Minnesota. Maybe that's why I remember him, but he was 11 and he was a boy that went missing while riding his bicycle home from a convenience store. And it was actually unsolved for years. It was unsolved until 2016 when some guy got busted on child pornography charges and he actually admitted to abducting and, and doing things to this kid and killing him. So sad end to the story. But yeah, that happened back in 1986 or 1987, somewhere in there. So yeah, crazy stuff. And even with myself, another little story for you. I remember I must have been seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there. And I was with my older sister. And we were walking home one day from a park that was a few blocks from my house, three or four blocks from my house. It was winter time. We were sledding. We had our little dog with us and we were walking home. So we had a sled and we had the dog, I think, if I remember correctly. And when we were leaving the park, I noticed this kind of creepy guy in a car really eyeing us, really watching us. And I told my sister about it. I said, hey, this guy's kind of freaking me out over here and he's looking at us and he looks shifty. And of course she thought I was just trying to freak her out and scare her, but I pointed him out to her and I was like really serious about this. So we decided to run to this random house that was right across the street from the park. And we would just kind of go up there and pretend like we lived there. Like, oh, we're going home, right? So we rang that doorbell. No one answered the house. The guy drives past us and really kind of slow and kind of eyeballing us still. And then once he made it away from us and around the corner where he's out of sight, we decided, okay, let's run to another house. So we ran across the street and rang the doorbell on that one. Of course, nobody's home. So we sat there for a bit and we were peeking around the corner of that house and looking at the house that we had just left. Well, all of a sudden, what do we see pull up in that driveway, that old clunky car in that house that we were just at? Like, oh my gosh, like now we're totally freaked out. We're like, what in the hell's going on? We're panicked, we're young, we have a dog, and we say, to heck with it. At this point now, three blocks-ish from home, let's just cut through people's backyards and cut through alleyways and all that stuff and just get home. So we run through yards, we run through the snow, we're panicked, we just got the hell out of there. And that was, you know, one of my creepy 
encounters with a potentially dangerous person. Now, I don't know that man's intentions, but I can only assume that, I don't know, some single dude following a couple of young kids from a park seems pretty fucked up, right? That doesn't seem right. So yeah, there is some concern with parenting in this free-range parent style. Bad stuff can happen. It's few and far between, but it can happen. But I do think there is a happy medium where we're not letting our kids ride the subway alone at 10 years old, but we're also not dictating every move and every decision they make so they can still have some of that autonomy and independence. So let's go ahead and go through some pros and some cons of the free range parent and see if we can kind of figure out where that middle ground is. All right, so the pros. First one, independence and self-reliance. Well, no surprise there. This type of parenting really promotes those things, right? It gives kids the opportunity to explore, to problem solve, and make decisions on their own without our input, without the parent's input dictating what they do and what they can't do. This can actually also contribute to them developing more confidence in life skills because they're put in situations where they need to think for themselves and use their brains. There are some other studies within this article that I'm referencing that show kids that have independent mobility, that is freedom to travel independently from adults, have better mental health, they have better physical health, and they have actually stronger map reading and orientation skills, which is kind of cool. What comes to mind too is being in a workplace. None of us would like it if we work somewhere where our boss or our supervisor micromanaged everything we did. When we did our jobs, what we did, telling us every move to make, every button to push, whatever, how would that feel? That would kind of stifle your confidence and your creativity, wouldn't it? So I, it kind of relates, like I understand. I mean, kids are not adults, of course, and they do need some direction and, and they don't know how to function sometimes without parents, but I kind of understand it in that aspect. All right, on to the next pro, and that's better critical thinking and decision-making. Free range encourages kids to think critically and make decisions based off their own judgment, not their parents' judgment. So instead of kids looking to us for the answer on what to do, they have to think through the situation on their own, assess the risks, weigh the options, and take responsibility for the outcomes of their choices. And that's one of those things that helps them build those life skills, like I mentioned a minute ago. When doing things on their own, kids may encounter situations that require these skills to find their way home or cope with a challenge. So skills like problem solving, decision making, and resilience are all developed more naturally in these free range situations. Like I said, they have to do it on their own. They kind of figure it out on their own. And I mean, we want our kids to lean on us and know they can rely on us. But there's also a point where they need to know and learn to know that they can trust and rely on themselves to make some choices. Like I said, instead of immediately coming to us with a problem or looking for an answer on how to go about something, they can look within themselves and weigh those options on their own. And when they learn them naturally, it's not something that is taught like a lesson or a test or something that we feel like we have to just like drill in their head. They have that real world ability to do it on their own. I know I kind of repeated myself there a lot, but whatever. All right, the next pro, which is pretty self-explanatory, is it gets kids to activate that natural sense of curiosity and explore the environment around them. It lets them learn through hands-on experiences and engage in play with their peers. This gives them the opportunity to be more active, so it promotes physical health and well-being as well. And research has actually shown to link this. More independently mobile kids, ones that bike and walk and play outside with friends, tend to be healthier. They have higher activity levels. And it also helps develop their gross motor skills. They're not just sitting inside, sitting on a device and doing nothing. They're, they're using their bodies and using their brains in a different capacity than playing an iPad, I guess. And I always think back to when I was young, and maybe you think the same way too, but what were you doing most of the time when you were a kid? 
I was outside. I was pretending. I was riding my bike. I was taking it off sweet jumps with wood that I found behind the garage. I was going to parks with my sister, evading creeps in cars, right? And for my girls, summer break is here. Summer break is already here. Their summer break has started. And I want them to be outside playing, playing with friends, running in the sprinklers, riding their bikes around, not completely under my thumb or me hovering over them 24-7. I want them to think for themselves to a certain capacity anyways. I still want them to be safe, but I want them to problem solve and think of things to do and, and enjoy that time with their friends. And just like last week, I understand it can be hard depending on where you live. I'm not as apt to let my kids run around in the street or even in my front yard if I lived in Vegas. I know I said that same thing last week, but it's true. Or if you live in some other big metro area, or if you live in an apartment, you're not just gonna say, hey, go out to the parking lot and play. You know, that's, that's not possible. So there is still that safety aspect there, and I, I get that. And the last pro that I'll mention here quick is the social aspect, social skills, talking to their peers, even talking to other adults that they know, you know, other parents and stuff like that, that will help them grow and be confident as well when they get to speak up and use their voice, voice their opinions, ask questions, things like that. You ever watch your kids talk and when they're among their friends and they're out playing and you're not like right on top of them, you're off to the side and they're just doing their thing and they just chat it up, right? Mine just talk and talk and they bounce ideas off of each other and they do all this other stuff. But then of course, when they're around me for some reason, they kind of quiet down a little bit or they're siblings, so they're arguing with each other. So it's just kind of a funny observation I had that when I see them off by themselves, they are a lot more social than I thought they were. All right, so let's talk about a few cons. What are the cons of the free range parent? And then we'll get this kind of wrapped up here. The first one, the most prominent, is a safety risk, right? That's what's going to be the primary concern for any parent. Yes, giving our kids more freedom and independence is great, just like I talked about. And even though abduction and violence against kids is down from years ago, it's still a risk. It can still happen, right? And that's going to be a thought in our mind. Is it a risk that we're willing to take? Shit only takes one time. And it does really scare me as a dad. Scares me as a parent. It's always in the back of my mind. So there needs to be some precautions taken to limit that risk, which hopefully I'll get to here in a minute. Next con here is a lack of structure and supervision. Yes, I know that's what we're giving our kids. We're giving them less supervision. That's the goal, to loosen up on those aspects and allow them to make choices and be a little more free. But it can also come at a little bit of a cost. It could open the door to potential behavioral challenges and difficulties in rule following and routines in normal everyday situations. If kids are allowed and expected to fend for themselves and make all these choices on their own or make all these choices in their own lives while out playing and doing stuff without parents around. But when they get home, how do we get them to shut that off or tamp that down a little bit so they listen to us? We need them to do daily routines. We need them to do chores, self-care, homework even. And I've seen, I've seen this kind of happen. I've seen some kids where the parents let them be free. They do whatever the hell they want, right? But when it's time for the kid to get in line to listen and follow some rules and do tasks, the kid acts like a feral, untamed cat, screaming and yelling and pretty much telling off the parents and being very disrespectful and not listening and just continuing to do whatever they want despite the parent saying, hey, it's time to go or hey, you need to do this. They just don't care. So there could be a potential issue with giving kids too much freedom that that's kind of the result. That's what happens. So I don't really know how you balance that out. Next one is possible judgment from others. Just like I judge those fair little cat kids, it can happen across the board with other parents. People have different parenting styles and values and ideas that 
may not coincide with how you're parenting. So they may see your free range style as lacking control or being almost neglectful and they may not agree with you. Or even the notion that someone can call the authorities on you for letting your kid walk home alone from school or if they find out that you maybe left your kid at home and ran to the store real quick or something. Or if you let your kid run amok around town or completely go wild in your neighborhood. And stuff like that happens. It's happened all the time. I remember seeing it quite a few years ago. It was in the news where this mother was letting her kid walk home from a park. Kind of the same fashion that my sister and I were. And what happened? The police rolled up and picked the kids up and took them to CPS. And when the kids didn't show up from the park, the parents started getting all freaked out and calling the cops. And then come to find out, they found out where their kids were. So turned into this whole situation. All right, and the last con is the potential for kids to experience negative experiences. The idea is free rangers want to expose their kids to age-appropriate risks and situations, but there is always a possibility for them to come across negative experiences or face challenges beyond their capabilities, right? Of course, we have that injury aspect that I talked about, crashing the bike or falling out of a tree. These things can be a good learning experience for a kid, but... They can also be kind of concerning for parents. Maybe if the kid breaks their arm or breaks an ankle or knocks out their teeth, which I did that at the ripe age of 10 years old. It was not a great time. Flipped a mountain bike and did a face plant right into a concrete sidewalk. Knocked out my front teeth. It was, it was lovely. I'm being sarcastic. It was freaking awful. But yeah, that's a, that's a risk that could potentially happen. But kids could also be exposed to inappropriate content or situations with language, images, or discussions that are just beyond their maturity level. The internet really comes to mind here. There's so much terrible shit on there that it can be easily found and accessed and all that. And it can also open the door to online bullying as well. Especially if you let your kids use certain apps. And now it's not necessarily just the computer, but it's a cell phone using apps and Using social media, kids can get bullied very easily. They're not just maybe at risk at school. They're now at risk all the time if they're online. Another negative experience could be interactions with strangers. Could be other kids or other adults that may not have your kid's best interests at heart. There are still those freaking creeps out there. And there's still those real in-person bullies too. Like I said, I think it really just comes down to a balance of the two. In this case, the overparent and the free ranger. I know I didn't really talk about a ton of other parenting styles here, but we can't stifle our kids' potential and make all their decisions for them, right? We can't do that. But we also can't let them just roam the city streets, letting them do whatever the hell they want. We have to find that balance, and I think that balance will be beneficial for us as parents and them as kids as well. I think we can let go a little bit, back off from the overbearing version of ourselves, and embrace some of those aspects of the free-range style. That would kind of be a good start. I'm not saying we just need to embrace free-range parenting as a whole 100% because I don't think I could ever do that, but I think there's a lot of good little bits and pieces we could pull from there and sprinkle in our parenting style. You know, I don't think I'm going to need to hold my 8-year-old's hand to walk to the neighbor's house or make sure that they don't slip while going down the stairs or help her at the first sign of struggle when she's on the jungle gym at the playground or do her homework just because she says it's hard, right? I don't think I need to step in in any of those situations. But I'm also not going to let her ride her bike across a highway, a busy highway, so she can go swimming at the public pool or I'm not going to drop her off at the said park or playground and then leave and go to the corner pub for some chicken wings and a brewski, right? I'm not going to do that either. And also, when do we give them more freedom? I think that has a lot to do with when you see that they're capable of handling more responsibility. Not just, oh, my kid's five now, they can do this. Or my kid's eight now, they can do that. Or my kid's 11 and a half, that means they can do this. It really means that my kids can handle and do A, B, and C. Can she cross the street safely by herself? Does she know what to do if a panel van pulls up? Or does she know what to do if someone says, hey kid, your mom is hurt, come with me, right? 
do our kids know what to do in those situations? I mean, those are like the prominent ones that come to mind. Getting kidnapped or abducted. Do they know to not walk up to a van that has a puppy in it? Or whatever it may be. And there may be six-year-old kids that are much more responsible and have a lot more spatial awareness than a nine or a ten-year-old even. I think we just have to be proactive and discuss certain situations with our kids. I think that's pretty normal to do. What to do in this case or in that case. You know, teaching them about the stranger danger stuff or people that they don't know or not getting into vehicles or even going into houses of people they don't know. That's all things that you can just talk to them about. It's kind of hard, though, because it feels kind of deflating to me to have to explain to my kids about bad people being out there in the world and how sometimes kids can get hurt or get taken or get abused in some fashion when all my kids know, all any kids know, is innocence and not even thinking about any of those terrible things. It's almost like a glass shatter moment for them. And they just didn't realize that those things can happen. And to me, that just sucks to have to ruin that for them. That that really does kind of bug me. So all in all here, let's wrap this up. We need to make sure that we teach and show them how to weigh those pros and cons of an idea or a decision, right? How to consider the potential benefit and drawbacks of our actions. Help them understand that... All risks are not necessarily worth taking. They need to weigh those in their head and see if they are. We also have to really help them understand their personal values and beliefs. Encourage them to make decisions that are aligned with their beliefs and what they think is important and morally right. I think that's really important to do. All our kids, even us, we have a moral compass. We know what's right and wrong. And we really need to teach them how to use that. To not just go with the flow or go with the group because everyone else is doing it. Go do that thing because they're doing it. Help them trust their gut and let them know that it's okay to say no. It's okay to opt out and be like, eh, this doesn't seem like a good thing. I'm going to bounce, you know? I think these are all things that can help them immensely as they get older as well, where that peer pressure really kind of ramps up. Lastly, I think we need to make sure that we've established clear guidelines and boundaries so they know what's okay and what's not okay. That this behavior or this decision is not okay or it is okay, right? And that there are consequences to crossing those boundaries so we don't get into that issue of a kid being a little shithead and being disrespectful and all that. Like we don't want to have that other side of it. We want them to have that freedom, but still listen to us when we give them things to do. And we just have to remember too that this free range method isn't just giving all the decision making to our kids and letting them do whatever the hell they want. It's about finding that common ground, landing the helicopter, and then letting them figure out some things on their own and giving them a little bit, not wide open, but a little bit of independence and trusting them that they can make choices, solve problems, and make mistakes while still having supportive parents that will be there for them when they need it. Does that make sense? I hope it does. And even though I really shit talk technology and phones and iPads and all that and kids being on them, there's actually some really cool stuff out there that helps us give our kids some freedom and some autonomy while still being able to keep in contact and talk to them and see where they are with trackers and gizmo watches and Apple watches and stuff like that. They're actually kind of cool. You can see where they are. You can call them whenever. You can send them a message. It's almost like that funny kid leash that we used to see and make fun of when we would see the toddler running around at the mall and they had the leash on. They're stretching the leash out and we're like, oh, what is that, you know? Well, now we have digital ones. As 30 and 40 year old parents, now we have digital ones. And it's actually pretty great because I have one for my kid and my five-year-old is super pumped when she's old enough to get one as well. So there are some options out there. Now I was going to mention a few other parenting types that I had kind of come across. I know I'm kind of running out of time here, but I'll just kind of run through these and explain them real quick. I thought they were kind of funny, the names were. First one was called a tiger parent and they expect first time obedience. They expect excellence in every endeavor and they expect a child to never talk back. I don't know, but that kind of sounds like a military school 
and not really a loving family. So that's uh, kind of wild. Helicopter parent we already talked about. The snowplow parent or the bulldozer parent. That's one who pushes obstacles completely out of the way of the child. Nagging teacher or another parent. Parents will jump right in and fight those battles. They'll bribe a coach to get playing time, whatever it may be. They uh, make it super easy for the kid to just skate through life, I guess. Free range parent, we've already talked about that. And the last one here was an attachment or gentle parent. I haven't really heard of this one before. And they believe that a child's earliest attachment to caregivers informs all subsequent attachments a person experiences. The argument suggests that emotional and safe physical attachments to at least one primary caregiver are essential to the child's personal development. Pretty much just means that if a kid has early strong bonds with caregivers, then they will have happier and healthier relationships as they get older. So, yeah, there's a few different uh, different parenting styles aside from the standard ones, the authoritarian, permissive, neglectful, and authoritative that we typically hear of on a lot of, you know, talks and websites and stuff. So, so what category do you fall in? Do you lean toward the overparent like I do at times? Or do you go the other way towards the free range? Or maybe you're a snowplow parent. I don't know. Either way, I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to embrace some independence for my girls. Kind of back off of the over parent and give them a little bit more freedom. And it's working. I think it's doing pretty well. Remember, I'm no doctor. I'm no psychologist. I'm none of those things. I'm just a guy that's trying to learn and share things with you. So... Anyways, that's all I have for today's episode of Stay Home Dad's podcast. Did I give you any insights? Did I give you any interesting tidbits? Or did you just listen to me ramble on for 30 minutes? Anyways, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a comment or send me a DM on the Stay Home Dad's Instagram page along with what kind of parenting style you use or maybe one that you think I should try. Please let me know. Also, if you have a minute and you like what I'm doing here, you like the show and all that stuff, please just submit a review on whatever listening platform you're on. That would really, really help me out. Anyways, thank you again so much for listening, hanging out with me. I will talk to you all next week. Bye.